And this evening's discussion is going to be Pure Land Teachings in Tendai. And this is one of the topics that had been mentioned several weeks ago during a sharing discussion. The topic itself is as complex, sophisticated, and as fruitful as Majamika or Yogacara. But I'm going to focus specifically on the Pure Land teachings as they relate to Tiantai and Tendai, with a few side notes as they relate to context and background. But I'm not going to go into the, um, the many permutations of Pure Land teachings that were found in China, um, nor into the modern Japanese uh, Pure Land teachings of Jodoshu and Jodoshinshu. And we'll start with to give everybody a background, and that is what is Pure Land? <clears throat> and what you see before you in that picture is the Phoenix Hall at Byodoin Temple, the Temple of Equality. And it's a temple which is both Jodo Shu and Tendai Shu sects combined. And the Paradise Gardens appear in the late Heian period, created by nobles belonging to the Amida Buddhist sect. And they were meant to symbolize paradise or the pure land, Jodo, where the Buddha sat on a platform contemplating a lotus pond. These gardens featured a lake, in an, uh, an island in a lake called Nakajima, where the Buddha Hall was located and connected to the shore by an arching bridge. The most famous surviving example is seen in this particular picture, the Phoenix Hall of Byodoin Temple. And this was built, this particular one was built in 1053. Stop. Huh? Let me go ahead and start the video back. That was just video on me, though, wasn't it? Hmm? But I didn't want to be seeing the picture. So, as an overview, a a an overview of the Pure Land could be its original intent, which was a Buddha field purified of transgressions and suffering by a Buddha and an auspicious place in which to take rebirth. It's also a specific place, the most famous of these fields, that of the Buddha Amitabha named Sukhavati. And there's it's also a tradition of texts and practices in Mahayana Buddhism dedicated to description of a number of these places and the practices to ensure rebirth in the Pure Land. Most recently, it is epitomized by the Jodoshu and Jodoshinshu schools of Japanese Buddhism. And that's probably where most people have heard this. <clears throat> and to give a little bit of background, I wanna start first by pointing out the, these temples that are on Hiezan. On the You'll notice in this photo, the Hokkaido on the left and the Jigyodo on the right. And then there's an elevated walkway between the two, thus composing Ninaido Hall. And the building on the left, Hokkaido, is a lotus hall where the 100-day practices of Shikan or Shamanta and Vipassana meditation are conducted. And the hall on the right is a Jodo training hall where the 100-day Jodo practice of circumambulating Amida while reciting Nambutsu takes place. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this is because it demonstrates how, while we think of the Pure Land in relation to the, the two Pure Land uh, groups in Japan, primary groups in Japan, Jodo and Jodo Shinshu, it's still a very active and vibrant part of Tendai. And during the early years, in Mahayana development, it was articulated that the Buddhas did not simply go into extinction, which would have been the case in uh, Nikaya Buddhism, but remained active in the world to help, being to help others being trapped in Dukkha. And it followed that the places that they dwelt in must reflect purity of their own wisdom. So the idea of the Buddha fields came into, into being. In other words, once it was determined that the Buddhas continued to work for good in the world, then the question is, well, where do they reside? And so this is you know, one of the explanations of that. And the Buddha land known as Sukhavati, the Western paradise, land of bliss, was ruled over by, or is ruled over by Amitabha, 
who came to predominate in popular culture in India and later in East Asia and Tibet. And by the way, just as a matter of convention, if I'm referring to Mahayana Buddhism in China and uh, India, Tibet, I'll usually refer to Amitabha. But if I'm referring to the same Buddha in Japan, I'll usually use the term Amida. They're the same, they're the same Buddha, just the pronunciation of the name is a little bit different. The longer Sukha, Sukhavati Vaya Sutra was compiled in the age of the Kushan Empire in the first and second centuries by order of Maheshasaka monastics who flourished in the Gandhara region of what is now ne uh, Nepal and um, India. Nagarjuna, the founder of Ma Majamaka school of Indian Mahayana Buddhism is credited with writing a commentary on the 10 stage sutra, which is actually a chapter of the Avantam Sakra flower garland sutra, in which he said that if, if there is a difficult, that it is, there is a difficult way of attaining enlightenment through self-cultivation, i.e. meditation and other methods. And then there's an easy way of attaining enlightenment by thinking of and calling upon the names of the Buddhas of the 10 directions. And one of the reasons I'm pointing out the figures that I'm talking about now is to firmly locate Pure Land Buddhism, not as some separate sect that was, or a separate school that was to the side of mainstream Buddhism in India, China, and then later uh, the rest of, of East Asia and Tibet, but it's really essential. And were, there were commentary by some of the, the, the real masters of early Mahayana Buddhism. And the next one is Vasubandhu, one of the founders of the Indian Yogacara school. So we have Nagarjuna, founder of the Majamaka school, and Vasubandhu, one of the founders of the India Yoga Kara school. And he's credited with writing the hymns of the aspirations for birth in the Pure Land, which is also known as the Discourse on the Pure Land, when its auto commentary is included. The hymns of aspiration for birth is a commentary on the Sutra of the Buddha of Infinite Light, which is one of the titles given to Amida Buddha or Amitabha Buddha. And its emphasis the visualization of Amitabha Buddha and the merit contained in the name. Now, when we talk about the Pure Land School in China, there was no Pure Land School per se, although one may speak of specific teaching lineages and social or religious movements at various points in Chinese history. It's a school in the sense of a school of thought. Many, if not most doctrinal and practice schools incorporated Pure Land teachings. Many scholars myself, as such as myself, wouldn't suggest that there were two practice schools and two doctrinal schools. The practice schools were the Pure Land and Cha'an, Zen, and the doctrinal schools were the Tiantai and Hua Yin. Pure Land practices had both an esoteric and an exoteric component. The circumambulating Nambutsu was very common practice. In this one visualizes Amida Buddha reciting while one recites Nembutsu, and the Chinese Namo Abhitafu and the Japanese Namo Amida Buddha endlessly while walking in samadhi around a statue of Amida Buddha. And I think that most people who are aware of Pure Land uh, in its modern forms, uh, Jodo and Jodo Shinshu, are not aware that Pure Land practices really began as esoteric. In Tiantai, <clears throat> and here we see the, the founder, Ji Gi. Uh, he was the founder of Tendai Buddhism in China. And we see the Pratyupana Sutta, translated by Lokushima, around 147 CE, contains the first known mentions of the Buddha Amitabha in his Pure Land. And this is thought to be the origin of Pure Land practice in China. And it's based upon this sect, upon this text, that a group of clergy at the Ting Lun's temple in China practiced the visualization of Amitabha together with the intention of gaining rebirth in Sukhavati, Sukhavati being the, the Western paradise. 
The emphasis of their practice was on visualization and not repetitions of the name, which came a little bit later. And the practice of devotion to Amitabha also became part of Tian Tai School from its inception. The founder, Chi Yi, made Pure Land Buddhism an integral part of his system of meditative practice. Chi Yi's four, uh, Chi Yi's major work, the Makashi Khan, describes four kinds of meditative practice, constantly sitting, constant sitting, constant walking, both walking and sitting, and neither walking nor sitting. The constant walking meditation practice was based upon the Pratyapana Sutta. It consisted of circumambulating a statue of Amitabha Buddha while chanting the Buddha's name and visualizing him. During the Sung Dynasty, there were large scale, this Sung Dynasty was from around 960 to 1279. There were large scale recitation societies with thousands of members formed under the auspices of Tian Tai masters. Moving on to Japan, we see Saicho Dengyo Daishi from 767 to 822 CE. Uh, he was the founder uh, and founder of Tendai Buddhism. And he was ordained in a Kokobunji temple, but returned to his native province in Omi to establish a hermitage on Mount Tie in 785, where he lived for 13 years. His public lectures on the Lotus Sutra came to the attention of the Wake clan and the imperial court. And then he petitioned the emperor Kamu to travel to China for advanced Buddhist studies in 804. And while in China, he received the full Tiantai transmission under Dao Tzu and Tsing Man at the Miao Le Temple. And he also brought the Oxhead School of Chan under, that he studied under Tsui Zhan and Mitsung, Japanese Mikyo under Hui Kong back to Mount Tian, from Mount Tiantai back to Japan. It, upon his return, he established the monetary and petitioned for ordinary, uh, for ordination, uh, an ordination platform. Oops. And the Tendai was established by decree in 804. He petitioned to permission for the ordination platform, but that was received shortly after his death in 822. The Tiantai school was the repository and transmitter of meditative techniques. Meditation directed toward Amida and the rebirth in Sukhavati were among the techniques introduced through Saicho upon his return from China. So therefore, we have the Pure Land being founded very early among the very early Mahayanists going to China. We see that it's present with such personages as Nagarjuna and Vasubandhu. And we find it being in the seventh century, uh, taking a very important place within Tiantai Buddhism, and then bringing it being brought to Japan with Dengyo Daishi after he returned from China. The Pure Land during the Heian era. And we have a picture here of Enin Zasu. And he was the third Zasu and is credited with introducing Pure Land practices formally. He studied and traveled around China collecting texts, treatises, and ritual manuals. And Enin was responsible for transmitting far more in terms of, in terms of intellectual material culture than any monk before him from the mainland of Asia to uh, Japan. And the transmission of Tang Buddhist culture profoundly transformed Japanese Buddhism. And the third Zasu, is credited with introducing the Pure Land practices formally, especially constantly walking meditation while visualizing and recitation of the Nembutsu, Namo Mirabu. This set the stage for subsequent developments of Pure Land philosophy and practices. Up until the time, Amida or Pure Land practitioners were seen primarily as cults, though some were very popular. Another person whom I'd like to mention at this time is Kuya, 
The first Japanese Jiri, itinerant monk who spread the Pure Land teachings through Nembutsu practice to the common person. He's famous for preaching in the marketplace for which he became known as the holy man in the marketplace. His wandering brought him from town to town where he begged for alms, which he then in turn distributed to the poor. He also preached in prisons, smooth roads, buried abandoned corpse, dug wells and built bridges. And he received his full ordination as a Tendai monk on Yezan in 948. This picture is a famous statue of Kuya practicing Nembutsu is now housed at his temple, Rokuhara Mitsuji in Kyoto. It shows the words of the Nembutsu emerging from his mouth in the form of Buddhas. And I, sh I should also mention another one, and that is, um, I'm trying to remember his name now, Iku, who was also another um, Tendai practitioner known as the dancing Nembutsu practitioner. Um, I, I don't have enough time to go fully into some of that, but another really fascinating character who brought uh, Pure Land practices into Japan through Tendai. But perhaps the most important to the development of Pure Land thought is the person of Genshin or Ishin Sozu. And here we see his retreat of Yoka in, in Yokawa, Shindo. And I choose to mention Genshin for several reasons. The first is that he was seminal to the development of Pure Land thought within Tendai and in Japan. As a matter of fact, he is one of the patriarchs of uh, Joroshu uh, Buddhism. He was an exemplary example of what Saicho and Tendai intended for monks. Lastly, his writings were highly inf influential for both Honin and Shinran. He was born in Yamata province, now Nara. His father, Masachika, was not particularly religious, whereas his mother was a pious Buddhist who eventually became a nun. He also had an elder sister who became a relatively famous nun. And he was a disciple of the now famous Yogen, Yogen from 712 to 985, who was famous for his debates and one of the spiritual protectors of the emperor. He became the 18th Sasu during a very critical period in Tendai development, and he revitalized Tendai after a period of decline. Genshin became a recluse in Yurikawa at a relatively early age, though he, favored he was a favored participant in the ceremonies on Hiezan. He eschewed a successful career to spend the rest of his life as a recluse in Yokawa. It is said that his mother scolded Genshin for participating with wealthy lay patrons and forgetting amongst primary duties of cultivating his own spirituality. Byukakugo Kambo is the first piece of writing, his first piece of writing on the Pure Land. And this is the method for contemplating Amida's Byukakugo, or 32 marks adorning the body of all Buddhas specifically visualizing between his eyebrows until you see it quite distinctly and clearly. When you visualize it, all 84,000 physical characteristics will spontaneously manifest. When you see Amida, you will see innumerable Buddhas of the 10 directions. Having visualized these innumerable Buddhas, you receive from each a prediction of future Buddhahood. This is the general perception of all physical characteristics of the Buddha and is known as the ninth contemplation. He's also the founder of the Ishin school of Tendai and the Nijugo Zanmai. This latter is a deathbed Nimbutsu, stipulating how the members would conduct this at the hour of death in order to successfully obtain birth in the Pure Land. At the time of its creation in the 10th century, it was a fellowship of 25 members, hence the name Nijugo. The Ojo Yoshu. Genshin started the work in the 11th month of 984 and completed it in the fourth month of 985. Genshin secluded himself in Yokawa from 980 until 988 
at which time he immersed himself in pure land teachings. Yokawa is the remotest of the several precincts of Mount Hiei. Todo and Saito are the center precincts of Mount Hiei, whereas Yoko is more than five kilometers from these other two precincts, down and up several peaks, and is the northernmost precinct. It is primarily used for hermitages, and its most famous temples is Shoryogon, the hall for the practice of meditation of heroic valor. Underlying the entire Pure Land system of Ojo Yoshu is Genshin's conviction that the world is in the midst of the defiled latter age in which the spiritual capacities of people had declined to the point where it is no longer possible to attain Buddhahood by relying solely on one's innate powers and abilities. And Genshin laments, although time-honored exoteric and esoteric forms of spiritual cultivation may be effective for those monks who are diligent and blessed with intellect, intelligence above and beyond the ability of someone who is as dull as he is, especially since it is now on the threshold of the latter Dharma, now being approximately the 11th century, 10th, 11th century uh, CE. Genshin considers birth in the Pure Land not as an end in itself, but as a step in the Bodhisattva's quest for Buddhahood. And by this, it's meant that one is reborn into the Pure Land to be reborn at a later time back into the samsaric world to work for the benefit of others. While Tadiki is required in this latter period, Jidiki is still necessary. Hence, meditations on the Pure Land and Nambutsu are both required for birth in the Pure Land. And for those who aren't aware of it, Jidiki is the work that one does on oneself to cultivate one's, one's own ability to become awakened, while Tadiki is what is seen as the blessings from the other, most notably by Amitabha to assist one in attaining rebirth in the Pure Land. In the 10th century, Genshin argues the efficacy of the Nambutsu practice derives from four, four factors. The power of one's past merits, the power of one's desires to seek birth in the Pure Land, the sustaining power of meeting one's vows, and the nurturing support of holy sages. The first two refer to the qualities possessed by the practitioners themselves, the merits they accumulated in the past and their ardent desire to achieve birth in the pure land. The next two are external factors, augmenting the efficacy of one's practice, the power of Amida's vows to bring all beings who undertake the Nambutsu to the pure land and the support and encouragement given to the Nambutsu practitioner by other holy beings, primarily great bodhisattvas like Kanan Basatsu and Seishi Basatsu. Nambutsu can refer to a variety of practices from sublime contemplation of Amida's name conducted in a state of samadhi to the less difficult act of reciting Namo Amida Butsu. The Ojo Yoshu is the starting point of all contemporary Pure Land philosophy and practices in Tendai and you might say in Japan as a whole. In contemporary perspective, <clears throat> I and by the way, this is Zenkoji in Nagano, and Zenkoji is a temple that is also uh, run by both Jodo Shu and Tendai Shu. So it's the, it's one of the several temples in Japan that are uh, duly um, organized around both Jodo Shu and Tendai, and the markless practice, I think, is really a statement that is a contemporary view of what is consistent between Pure Land teachings and the three truths as one truth in Tendai philosophy and practice. And that is, even while remaining mindful of the Buddha, by reciting his name and seeking the Pure Land, contemplated in the following way, Amida's body and land are ultimately empty, like mirages or dreams. Although they are identical with their substance, they are empty. While empty, they exist. They are neither existent nor empty. To realize this non-duality and truly enter the supreme truth, 
This is called the Markless Nembutsu. This is the Supreme Samadhi. <clears throat> and I'll briefly describe uh, contemporary, uh, the con beyond the contemporary, with some conclusions. Tendai is devoted to the idea that there is no single way or practice toward awakening. Pure Land teachings are one of many. There are many excellent methods of practice that will lead to awakening. Furthermore, each temple and even region has embedded within it a tradition into history that leads the Jushoku or the abbot of that temple to be committed to a specific philosophy and sets of practices. Thus, you'll find some temples that are devoted to Mikyo or esoteric practices where they would do a goma fire purification ritual anywhere from daily to once a month to several times a year. This may in fact be the majority of Tendai temples in Japan. There are other temples that are dedicated to meditation and will be performing Shikan meditation on a consistent basis. Yet others may be devoted to pure land, both philosophically and by virtue of practice. Some temples are devoted to various forms of chanting practice and that becomes their focus. Yet others are primarily scholar monks who will include all the practice described above but will spend more of their time on scholarship. On Hiezon itself, there are many temples and each of these temples has a particular devotion and set of practices that reflect the practices above and more such as the Senichi, Senichi Kaihogyo or thousand day pilgrimage, running, walking about a marathon a day for a thousand days. Each Tendai monk who trains on Enrakuji on Hiezon in Japan must demonstrate competence in all of these areas, but upon completion of Kanjo, will specialize in their own way. And these are some of the sources that I use this evening. And now I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask questions, have comments or thoughts. Hold on a second till I get a picture of everyone here. Xenon, you have your hand raised. Um, I wanted to ask, is the Pure Land something that exists in our world or is it a sort of separate dimension or, you know, that kind of thing? That's a really good question. And there are, I'm, I'm certainly not a, a Pure Land scholar. That's not my area. But from my understanding, there is an incredible amount of literature discussing that very issue. And one of the responses for that was that, and, and this would be more from a Tendai perspective, but one of the responses for that is that it must be that those of us who have yet to attain awakening when we look about us, all we see is samsara. We see the samsaric world, the, the world of, of um, uh, the mundane world, if you will. But for the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, because they've been awakened, when they look around them, what they see is the pure land. And so that it, in, if you will, we are existing within a pure land, but we're unable to really see it because we're not yet fully awakened. There were other Chinese who argued that in fact it was like a separate dimension or a separate place that one could actually physically go to. Um, so there's no real response to that definitively. It depends upon how one is looking at it. Thank you. Do we have another question? Uh, Joe, go ahead. First, first Joe, and then Linda, do you have your hand up also? Yes, I have it. Okay. First job and then Linda. Well, um, I have two questions, but uh, okay. So let me ask you quickly. Okay, one, when you spoke about Nagarjuna and then as a precursor to the Pure Land, you said that basically he presented two options, easier and difficult. And the easier right. has to do with Nembutsu. Why, why, why if there is an easier way we need the... Uh, we need a more difficult one. So that, <laughs> that's one question. Okay, another For, question. But another, uh, Joe, before I answer that, before, before you leave, 
then you have to ask Shinra on that. <laughs> okay. uh, another question is, okay, so today's presentation was fascinating as a history of ideas, you got but, it. but I would like to hear from you, Monshin Sensei, where, when and where do you see the contemporary relevance of the insights uh, given by or developed by uh, the Pure Land School? When do you as a Buddhist or as a human being think, oh, here I need really insights from the ten, uh, Pure Land School? Okay. I'm going to ask you to wait until my Dharma talk because that's what my Dharma talk is about. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Because I knew somebody was going to ask that question, so I, that's why I gave the. That's why I created it in the Dharma talk. Oh, but answer for that, the first questions. Why yeah. simple? Oh, oh well, I, because I told him yes, Shinron. <laughs> that's what Shinron yeah. said. Why should I go to all this trouble when all I got to do is <laughs> is have faith in in the pure land? Yeah. Um, Sam first, Linda, and then Sam. Linda. Um. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, so for the Tendai, uh, when you achieved the Pure Land, um, you're just on the path to uh, the Bodhisattva, you're just on the Bodhisattva path. You haven't actually achieved being a Bodhisattva and then returned to the human realm. I'm just wondering, like, I'm thinking of J uh, Jodo Shinshu versus Tendai as far as, because I think with them, it's, there, it's like you become a full Bodhisattva once you achieve the Pure Land. And you're but, just there, yeah. Well, and, and that has to do with the idea of Mapo, the period of the degenerate Dharma or the latter age, in which from a Tendai perspective, we still need both Tadiki and Jidiki uh, to attain awakening. And so going to the pure land, one will, um, from, a, from a Tendai perspective, when one goes to the pure land, you go there to attain awakening as a, and, and become a bodhisattva to return to the work for the benefit of others because we're in, we are not in an age in which people cannot become awakened. From the Jodo Shinshu perspective, we're in the age in which it's impossible for people to be awakened without the benefit of Amida Buddha. That would be the, that would be the clearest distinction between those two viewpoints. Okay, that, thank you. Okay. Uh, Sam, you had your you had your hand yeah, So essentially, Amida worship is esoteric practice, right? I would well, I would say that um, Amida worship started as esoteric practice. The way that it's practiced, and and you would I would argue that actually doing the circumambulating Nambutsu practice as they yeah. do on Hiezan, which we've done here during retreats, yeah, yeah. is a form of esoteric practice because you're right. visualizing, you're yeah. reciting Nambutsu, that makes it es esoteric. Um, but the way that it's practiced, let's say in Jero Shinshu would not be esoteric because they're not doing those practices. Belief okay. in Amida Buddha in and of itself is sufficient to be reborn into the pure land. Does that, does that make sense? Or at least you understand the response. <laughs> yeah, I understand what you're saying, but <laughs> they don't practice uh, uh, circumambulation of, uh, of Amitabha and- No. Visualization no. of Amitabha? <clears throat> no. Jodo Shu, Jodo Shu by itself, Jodo, not Jodo Shinshu, Jodo believes in the recitation of Nimbutsu, but for Jodo Shinshu, they don't require recitation. They require following the Shila. In other words, living a good moral life and having mm -hmm. faith in Amida Buddha, depending nice. upon the, the, the uh, Amida Buddha to bring one to the pure land through one's faith. Through faith. Okay. Yep. Any other? Brian. Brian? Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I'm kind of uh, just, and I've said this before for people, I, I do go to the New York Buddhist church, which is Jodo Sinshu, mm -hmm. but I, I am a subversive. <laughs> church I mean, I, I love, I love what they, my Zanga there gives me and it has helped me a great deal, but kind of what Job was saying, 
in my practice and my experience, the pure land and this land I live in interpenetrate each other. And there are moments when I'm saying, I'm in the pure land. Wow. And then there are other moments when, no, this is total samsara. There is no pure land. Right. What? Oh. Yeah. And that is kind of how I experience. So I've kind of, you know, just, I kind of figure, well, Shinron took what he learned and then changed it so I can take what Shinron taught and I can change it. And I can, I can adapt it to what I to what I find. And just one thing what Sam says, it's not quite, and I struggled with it. It's not like you worship Amida Buddha. It's you kind of, I've come to the recognition that Amida Buddha is outside me and also within me. So when I'm calling on him, I'm talking to myself and it's kind of, it, it, you're kind of calling upon yourself to be that way. So it's other power that is also in self power. And I that's the best I can do at this point. Okay, thank you. Tomia, you, you had your hand up. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. I'm really fascinated by the, the concept of um, the way, I'm hoping to learn about the concept of the way you're using the word field in the first quarter to half of your talk. The Buddha field. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are many different ways that you use the word field. And it was really fascinating because we're also talking about pure land and different dimensions. And so I was hoping that you would um, give me a simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> All of the fields. No. Um, yeah. Could you um, could you fill me in? Well, I, I think the simplest is to go back to the original uh, material that I'd make, made reference to uh, from the sutras. And that is, there was a logical inconsistency in early Mahayana. And that is that the Buddhas, well, in, in the Nikaya Buddhism, once Shakyamuni Buddha died from a Nikaya perspective, that was it. Shakyamuni Buddha died. And now it would be maybe other Buddhas in the future who might develop. And that's where the idea of the, of the uh, Maitreya came from. Sometime in the future, there would be another Buddha who would, who would teach us once Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings were no longer relevant for a period of time, had totally disappeared. The, the Buddha field came about because in early Mahayana, they, they turned that notion of the Buddha, the Buddha's extinction on its head and they said, no, the Buddhas had been in the past, the Buddhas are now, and the Buddhas are in the future. The past, the present, and the future are really one and the same. This was in early, early Mahayana. And therefore, the Buddha that had died, meaning Shakyamuni Buddha, had not just been extinguished, but that Buddha still exists. So the idea is, where does he exist? Well, he exists in the Buddha fields. In this, I think of the Buddha fields as the universe. Mm. He exists in the universe to continue to work toward the benefit of others. If the notion of the bodhisattva is one who works toward the benefit of others, which is the, the, the you would say, the centerpiece of Mahayana thought, then the Buddha could not just suddenly say, I'm out of here. There can be other Buddhas developing at the same time. Where do they exist? So the idea of the Buddha field came about as a result of that very simple logical premise. And so I, I think of the Buddha field not as, maybe it is in, you know, I, I like the explanation that Brian was giving. Uh, I think that we can experience uh, the pure land and the Buddha fields here and now and in the future and in the past, that it's all intertwined. I think that, that when we think of the mundane, in the same way as we think of the mundane world and the absolute world, they're really not two worlds according to Buddhist, uh, according to Tendai teachings. It's the middle way. They exist simultaneously. And so that so in that sense, the Buddha fields can be both simultaneously where we are, and in another place. Does that, does that 
maybe it doesn't clear it up, but at least in the right direction. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I felt like I got closer when uh, almost like realm. Yeah. Yeah, realm. But that's not the term they use. I was using the, the yeah, literal no, translation. I, I'm fascinated by that usage of field, um, almost like it's an aura, but then mm -hmm. it blew up to a different time scale that right. really um, was engaging. So thank you. Thank you. Jake, this will have to be the last question. Oh, I'm sorry. You say you got Jake and then you say and you say you, yours is the last question. Go ahead, Jake. So um I have a question, but just before I get to the question, I just wanted to say that in the Vimala Kirti Sutra, it actually, at least in the Robert uh, Thurman translation, it does talk about Buddha field within the first few chapters. So right. if you check that out, Tomia, you might enjoy that because there might be something there for you that can help with that. But um, my question actually had to do with Genshin. So when you were talking about the two, um, how the, there's, it mentioned the, um, importance of studying the pure land or med meditations on the pure land and also uh, reciting Nambutsu. And I was just wondering if in that context is meditation like a very strictly kind of more towards like the actual formal meditation or can that also include something just as simple as like hearing the sutra? Um, it's, it's actually, it's, you know, well, remember, it's the third, the third walking and sitting of <laughs> Chi Gi is the Amitabha circumambulating Nembutsu. And that's a samadhi. That's a that's a regular samadhi. You're not sitting with your legs crossed, so to speak, but it's a it's a full meditation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, somebody else has their you say, yes. Yeah, okay. So um it was I guess it's instructive that you uh talked about how you know, the collapsing of what we call the, the middle way, it's, it's all of the past, present and future, and also, you know, the, uh, so I, I was thinking of how, you know, when we talk about the, say, the other shore, um, you know, whether we're actually on this shore or like on the raft in the middle of the river, or we are actually at the other shore, already, you know, and is, what is the other shore? Is it Nirvana? Is it Anatar? Is it pure land? Or, you know, and like, if it's a pure land, you know, does it necessarily need to be like Amitabha's pure lands, you know, considering that we're in the Saha world, which is Shakyamuni's pure land. Like, right. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I guess, like, I don't know if my question is like, you know, I guess like, you know, we have, we sometimes we make these distinctions and it's like, you know, I guess, is it just like a matter of affinity or context or, you know, I mean, I guess it all points to like skillful means, but, but still it, it's, 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 it makes it all like, you know, very, ambiguous as well. <laughs> well, I, I think, I think, think about the other shore as an allegory yeah. as opposed to an actual place. I mean, the other shore for me is Albany County, but that's a different issue. <laughs> but in all seriousness, what you're talking about when you're talking about the other shore is if you're talking about in the Heart Sutra, the other shore is awakening. If you're talking about uh, in some contexts, the other shore is actually going from being a person who has not been exposed to Buddhism to a person who has taken refuge. That's the other shore. So the, the term the other shore is used in many contexts to mean many different things. I don't think that there's one thing that we can point to and say, well, that's it. Yeah. I wanted to, to very, I hope that's sufficient. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, but Ichishima Sensei, I know that your father had, when he built Senzoji, that was what, back in the 50s, right? In the 1950s, when he rebuilt, I should say, your temple Senzoji. He really made that temple to be very much like a Pure Land temple, in my viewpoint. Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and it seemed to me that in, even though he had done 
some of the 100 day practices on Hiazon, that he had still been in some ways much more of a, a pure land practitioner. Would you say that was true? Yeah. Uh, our main image of Buddha of Sendoji is uh, Amitabha Buddha, and uh, such uh, that style of the building, uh, I think, is from uh, Mount Hiei's Amitabha Hall, and also uh, Jogyodo. Uh, you mentioned in the Ninaido at the mm-hmm. Saito, where you see a practitioner walks around the. Uh, um, Amitabha Buddha uh, constantly 90 days until he sees uh, his own Buddha within his mind. Then uh, senior priest, uh, uh, you know, t- attested him whether he really uh, encountered with Buddha within himself or not. And the uh, practitioner, when uh, the, uh, he passes that k- kind of questions, then he enters into Jodo Inn, where the you know Saicho's tomb there, a uh, secluded life for 12 years. <laughs> this is called the Rosangyo practice, of, you know, uh, concentration of uh, what shall I say, meditation, and as if uh, Saicho still uh, alive, <laughs> and he really uh, serves to him uh, daily. Uh, I never get out of mountain for during the 12 years secluded life. Still, uh, there are some priests who are doing it. Yeah, that is, uh, so uh, back to the uh, uh, Amitabha's uh, constantly walking meditation. This is uh, really to- uh, always uh, uh, <coughs> uh, repeating the name of Amitabha. Um, for, for 90 days, very extreme ways. But they, uh, my father himself, he did the uh, Kaihogyo uh, at Mount Hie at the very early times. And uh, <clears throat> so he's kind of a Gyoja a practitioner and he likes that kind of uh, Amitabha very much. And of course, you mentioned about Shindan. Also, Shindan is, of course, uh, very devoted Buddhist priest. He stayed at Mount Hie over 29 years, oh but uh, he left there uh, <laughs> uh, to meet his own um, way of uh, worship. And uh, at the Rokkakudo Hall in Kyoto, down uh, uh, Mount Hie, he meditated uh, 100 days, but uh, just a week before the uh, fulfillment, he saw some Guze Kannon, Kannon, uh, Avarokite Subara in his dream. If you, you, you cannot get out of your desire, emotion, uh, such, you know, attachment to the women, etc., I will appear as a beautiful woman to be, uh, you see, loved with you. And so he waked up oh, my practice is not enough. But uh, I, so he approached the Honen, founder of Jodo Shu, uh, even such a degenerated person myself, uh, Shindan, is it possible uh, to attain Nirvana, etc.? Of course, why not? You see, those who are suffering people, that suffering itself is very important factors. Uh, so in order to reduce such kind of suffering, uh, he or she does practice, etc. And about the soon, uh, Shinran and uh, Honen uh, persecuted to uh, go uh, on the remote places. And uh, Shinran really uh, doubted why uh, we are devoting to Buddhism so much, but uh, we should be uh, persecuted by the government. And uh, at that time, Honen answered to him, you see, uh, there are so many places for suffering, the place where you go, northern part of Japan, that is Noto Peninsula near Niigata Prefecture. And so you just 
uh, encounter with them and guide them to the pure land. So, and the, but uh, uh, Shindang and uh, Honen will not meet together in this life, but next life, Amitabha's life, then we can see each other on the, uh, you know, the uh, lotus pond, etc. So uh, I think uh, um, today's discussion we mentioned, uh, pure and, uh, of course, in uh, Japan, Genshin really, uh, he was a founder of Japanese uh, uh, Amitabha worship, I think, uh, as a practice. And uh, like that person like uh, Honen and Shindan really liked him and followed that way. But in the case of uh, Tendai, we do not deny anything. Just, you know, uh, such an extreme way of uh, Tariki, other power like uh, Amitabha or Jiriki like uh, Dogen who started the uh, Japanese uh, uh, Zen Buddhism. Uh, he's, he just followed Shakyamuni Buddha as he awakened by himself uh, for his meditation. So such extreme way of seeking uh, pure end like uh, Shindan, other self you know, uh, asking, relying on the other power. And at the same time, you know, Dogen relied on his awakening. So that kind of two extreme part, really uh, interesting. And uh, they all studied at Mount Hie, uh, starting point. And uh, uh, so uh, I think, uh, uh, both, you know, Shindan's ways, very wonderful. And uh, my father's, uh, he did the uh, pilgrimage uh, on a hundred days at, uh, right after, you know, the, the Mount Hie, uh, Kaihogyo, running around the mountains, such a practice uh, stopped for a while. And so uh, his uh, teacher requested him, why don't you start again this Kaihogyo? And so he was an uh, initiating person who restarted Kaihogyo, Gyoja, at Mount Hie. And, and uh, when he returned to our temple, Senzoji, he, uh, he was presented by his teacher, uh, Enami Soken, uh, <coughs> Ryogen's, you know, the, Ryogen is a teacher of. Uh, Mm, Genshin. And uh, so Ryogen, Ganzan Daishi, is kind of my protector. See, uh, when I was born uh, May the 3rd, 1939. <clears throat> and the 3rd uh, of January, I think uh, that is very important day for Ryogen. Uh, he's a uh, teacher of Genshin. And Ryogen uh, uh, was very pioneering person. Uh, well, and so I, I was saved by Ryogen, uh, Ganzan Daishi, maybe two or three times in my lifetime. Uh, when I almost uh, dying, <laughs> almost uh, 40 years ago, that uh, Ryogen appeared in my uh, mind and uh, uh, who saved me out of this. So such experience were very interesting. And uh, I went to such, you know, uh, uh, what shall I say, hell, uh, when I was 49 years old. And uh, at that time, when I was walking uh, the bridge uh, between Saha world, this world, and the other world. Then on the way to the other world, I heard uh, screaming from a lady uh, who met when I was in California. It's Shima Sensei, please help me. So, oh, my God, but I have nothing to help you. So would you wait for a moment? and to find some tools to save her from such a heavy uh, fire world. And, uh, but I promised her to 
uh, save her. And so I tried to return to this Safa, Safa, Saha world, this world, you know. Uh, it was so heavy, but uh, finally, when I finally touched one step on this uh, earth, then I realized that I re returned from the other world, I think. And uh, at that time also, I experienced such a uh, uh, Ryogen's advice. Oh, well, I'm sorry to talk about my life story. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Sen thank you, Sensei. Thank you. We're going to continue, and we're running a bit late, so the sh the the meditation this, this evening will have to be a bit shorter than normal because we're about twenty minutes over time. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we'll have we'll have a short meditation. Thank you so much, and I'm just going to continue yeah. now. In preparing for this evening's discussion on the Pure Land, I thought of several issues that people might raise or at least have in mind. And as it turned out, Job asked the question pretty directly. Some of the people attending this evening's, this, this evening's discussion dismiss birth, rebirth, and they would then suggest, why am I bothering to study the Pure Land, which is contingent upon the notion of rebirth? That's not to say that we shouldn't study Pure Land because it's a major facet of Buddhist practice in most schools of Buddhism around the world. As such, it provides us insight into Buddhist practices of the last several thousand years. Regarding rebirth itself, it's a very personal issue to me. And I hope you'll forgive this personal narrative. Many of you know that part of my story is that I was actually the notion of rebirth that brought me to Buddhism directly. And that is to say, I had been studying Taoism and sort of toying with Buddhism when I was as young as, as 14 years of age. And in high school, like most, if not all adolescents, I gave thought to heaven and hell, life after death, the, you know, the big existential stuff. And I had pretty much determined that these stories were not consistent with how I perceived the world around me and were tales that supported moral philosophies. And as such, they were okay, but nah, heaven and hell just didn't make it for me. <laughs> Until that is, my physics class. Mr. Mann, my physics teacher, assigned us a section on the law of thermodynamics. And there I was formally introduced to the idea that matter is neither created nor destroyed. And in my biology class, I discovered that thoughts, which at the time I took to be an aspect of consciousness, are composed of electrochemical reactions within the brain. Further, there is something within humans, flora, and fauna that we define as an animating force. Is this energy, or as the Taoist writings describe as chi, or in Japanese, ki? I don't know. I was young and dumb and filled with more questions than answers. But it did seem that after our biological bodies have stopped functioning, that we begin to decompose. That energy, chi, ki, electrochemical residue, must transform into something else. Thus, I was left looking for a philosophic understanding, and this led me to the Buddhist teachings. Years later in college, I was privileged to be exposed to Einstein's theories, and more recently, to quote from Lanz and Berman. As Einstein wrote shortly before his death in 1955, we convinced physicists the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Putting all the proceeding together, I think of the Heart Sutra's words, form is empty and emptiness is form. No old age and death, no end to old age and death. No extinguishing, no path, no wisdom, and no gain. No gain, and thus the Bodhisattva lives, Prajnaparamita. The last 60 years of my life, I have intellectually challenged the notion of rebirth, only to continually find evidence of rebirth in the natural world. I could go on about this, but I won't for now. This personal, is this personal story, personal story intended to convince anyone of rebirth? No, not really. It is to say that for me, rebirth is a rational conclusion 
to a very honest search. I do believe in the pure land. Do I believe in the pure land? Belief to me in this sense is irrelevant. I know that I'm part of the universe and the universe is by its very nature free of defilements and impurities. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that how the pure land is described? The descriptions of the pure land are people's understandings of what a land free from samsara would look like. They are colorful, culturally imbued visions of the Buddha fields. To me, these Buddha fields reflect my cultural worldview. When this bag of bones has turned to ash, the residue of this lifetime will continue to be a part of the same universe, the same Buddha fields. The karma from this, my lifetime, will continue to have an influence on all those with whom I have had contact, the trees, animals, streams, with the earth upon which I have lived. This is not eternalism because that the I that I hold in onto provisionally now will cease to be, but it has only been an illusion anyway, as is the past, present, and future. The part of the pure land which we allude to, but do not often directly address, is that of hope, comfort, and an integration with an interpenetration that is around and through us. The pure land is a place, a place into which we become indivisible with all that is, Svaha. And to quote, we're all born with selfish desires, so we can all relate to those feelings in others. But kindness is something made individually by each person. So it's easy to misunderstand when others are trying to be kind to you. Natsuki Takiya.